August of 1911, Alfred Robinson wrote this essay, An Exposition Dream, for California Garden Magazine. Planning for the Panama, California Exposition to be held in Balboa Park in 1915 had begun. The park's 1,400 acres at that time consisted primarily of coastal sage scrub. And I fell asleep and I dreamed. And in my dream, I went forward instead of back. It was the year 1915, and I'd returned to San Diego after an absence of four years. Much wandering in other lands had filled my mind's eye with trees and grass as familiar setting for every scene, so that the browns and grays of the mesas and hills seemed barren and lifeless. With my friend, we went out and boarded a streetcar and quickly reached the gates of the Panama, California Exposition. Entering, we headed for a band which seemed to be located at the end of an avenue of Eucalyptus ficifolia, whose blood-red blossoms flamed in the electric light. I had entered the Garden of Eden, palms and ferns and flowering plants on all sides, sending out the delicate scents of the night air a draft as intoxicating as champagne. We soon were in the largest lath house ever projected as a pleasure resort. Up its supporting columns ran choice vines, jasmines of such sweet savor, begonia and tacomas of gaudy hue, and the curious Dutchman's pipe. Palms from many lands and many forms lined the borders and were in beds here and there while begonias and other foliage plants nestled at their feet. Is it not strange there was not a thing like this in San Diego 50 years ago? Hello, I'm John Blocker. Welcome to San Diego Floral Association's virtual tour of the Botanical Building here in Balboa Park. Robinson's article created quite a stir in the city. By November of 1911, just three months later, the exposition directors had allocated $30,000 to build a lath house. Robinson founded the San Diego Floral Association in 1907, a group that is still active today and has its office here in the park. Kate Sessions, San Diego's great horticulturalist, was a founding member. In 1909, Robinson also founded California Garden Magazine and was its first editor. The lath house he proposed was to be 500 feet square and have a dome 50 feet tall. In 2015, we celebrated the 100-year anniversary of the 1915 Panama, California Exposition. Most of the buildings now along the Prado, including the Botanical Building, were built for this exposition. This exposition created the historic core of the park we still enjoy today. In 1868, far-sighted city fathers set aside 1,400 acres of land for a park. Only about 2,000 people lived in the city at that point. Very few improvements were made to the park until the exposition buildings were built and the grounds landscaped. The exposition, of course, celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. San Diego would be the first port of call in the United States, and San Diegans hoped to lure ships into its beautiful harbor to offload their cargo. In 1909, when the planning for the exposition began, San Diego was still a small city with a population of 40,000 people. San Francisco also hosted an exposition in 1915, celebrating the opening of the Panama Canal but their population was 10 times San Diego, or 400,000. Despite not drawing many ships into San Diego Bay, the exposition was successful in enhancing the city's reputation and promoting growth in the region. So how did a small city like San Diego manage not only to hold an exposition, but create a complex of buildings and grounds that lasted 100 years and it's still loved by San Diegans today. Number one, they hired great architects who created great buildings and grounds. 
This is probably the most photographed view in the park, and certainly along with the California Tower and the Cabrillo Bridge, one of San Diego's most iconic views. Carlton Winslow des designed this lath house. He was trained as an architect at the famous Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. You would call the design of the building English. It is designed along the lines of the great glass houses or plant conservancies found initially in England at places like Kew Gardens with the long sides and dome center. It is 250 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 60 feet tall. It has a steel superstructure and is covered with 12 miles of redwood lath. It is not the 500 foot square building Robinson projected. According to Balboa Park historian Richard Amaro, there is no record of why Robinson's plan was not followed. When it was built, the botanical building was the largest lath structure in the world. Henry Huntington built a larger lath house at his estate in San Marino, but that lath house no longer exists. Today, the botanical building is again the largest lath house in the world. There are other large lath structures in Bar Barcelona and in the Melbourne area of Australia. Carlton Winslow also designed these buildings we see along the Prado. All these buildings have been reconstructed. In 1915, they were designed to be temporary. The lath house was one of the four structures initially designed to be permanent. The others were the Cabrillo Bridge, the California Quadrangle, which is the buildings around the small square where the California Tower is located, and the Spreckled Organ Pavilion. Carlton Winslow worked under Bertram Goodhue, the head architect for the exposition. Goodhue was one of the finest architects in the United States. He studied at Columbia. So again, a small city of 40,000 people managed to hire one of the best architects in the United States to build its park. The type of architecture Goodhue used, and that you see here, is called Spanish Colonial or Spanish Revival. Goodhue had traveled in Mexico and contributed to the book published in 1902 by Sylvester Baxter, Spanish Colonial Architecture in Mexico. The architecture is reminiscent of a type of architecture you might see in colonial Mexico or in the older parts of Spain. It became so popular that this style of architecture was used all over Southern California for the following 20 to 30 years. It is also reminiscent of a past we never had here in San Diego. We were colonized by Spain, but the mission was the only building of note in the area besides the adobe houses. Goodhue is also responsible for the layout of the park, and it is his layout that creates this dramatic view. We are standing on the Prado, or the main access of the park. It aligns perfectly with Laurel Street, crosses the Cabrillo Bridge, comes into the park, and ends at the B. Evanson Fountain. We are standing at a cross axis to the main axis of the park. The lily pond leads the eye to the symmetrically placed botanical building. The lily pond was inspired by a trip Burton Goodhue made to Persia, now called Iran, in 1902. It also looks like water features found in the Moorish part of Spain. So right here, we have a Persian water feature, Spanish revival buildings, and an English plant conservancy not to mention the Italianate balustrade on the bridge, right here in one spot. Hey, it's California. Turn around. Before these trees grew, you could see all the way down to the city and the bay. We are on a mesa here. It is almost like we can look down and still see sky. The designers could have connected the buildings and blocked the view, but they did not. They left us this great view all on the cross axis. During the exposition, the lagoon was called 
La Laguna de los Flores, or the Lagoon of the Flowers, even though most of the flowers were growing in the smaller lagoon on the other side of the bridge. That lagoon was called La Lagunita, or the Small Lagoon. The large lagoon was also called La, La, La Laguna de los Espejos, or the Lagoon of the Mirrors. You can often see reflections of the clouds in the sky or a reflection of the botanical building on the surface of the water. Water plants or water lilies were not grown in the pond until the mid-1930s. The botanical building has been here over 100 years and it has survived through a lot of our country's history, some of which led to some unintentional neglect. In 1917, during World War I, the Navy occupied the park. The bottom of the lagoon was cemented to provide a pool to teach tailors, sailors to swim. Boats were tethered to the lagoon sides so sailors could also practice rowing. There was another exposition held in the park in 1935 and 1936, the California Pacific International Exposition. But the Botanical Building was again a major display for that exposition. During World War II, the Navy again occupied the park. Much of the park was used as a hospital for wounded servicemen. The pool was increased in depth and resurfaced. It became a rehabilitation pool for patients recovering in park hospitals. Because of the war effort during World War II, the botanical building and many of the gardens in the park were not maintained. The building deteriorated and it was also vandalized. In 1944, just before the war was over, the city of San Diego considered demolishing the building. After the war, the Navy paid to restore the buildings in the park they had used. Since they did not use the botanical building, no money was allotted for its restoration. In 1947, the city drew up plans to restore the building, but the plan was not immediately implemented. Around that time, the lagoon was used briefly as a children's wading pond and as a site to practice fly fishing. The botanical building continued to deteriorate, and in 1949, the building was condemned and closed. In May 1955, a neighborhood magazine article described the closed, dilapidated, and vandalized botanical building as an eyesore. However, the few surviving plants in the building were still being tended by park staff who hoped the building would be saved. It was not until March of 1959, after a major renovation, the botanical building reopened. It had been closed for 10 years. The major renovation changed the historic look of the building. The original building had arched stucco arcades extending from each side. They were removed. At the back of the building, there had been a glass house or hothouse where plants that require more heat, such as many varieties of orchids, were grown. It too was demolished in 1959. Now there is a parking lot behind the building. Now look from here at the center of the bridge toward downtown San Diego. The lagoon draws the eye to the space between the buildings and into the sky. It is a pleasing scene and one intentionally designed by the architects working under Bertram Goodhue. The botanical building has undergone two major renovations. One that redid the metal framework began in 1993. The building was closed for almost two years. The plant collection at that time numbered 1,200 plants. Another major renovation occurred in 2001. The steel framework was again reinforced and the 12 miles of redwood lath were replaced. This renovation took nine months. The number of plants in the lath house then numbered 2,100. The state of California has given the city $9 million for another major renovation that should be starting soon. The National Park Service also granted the city a quarter million dollars for restoration. 
Welcome to the Botanical Building. Look around. It is San Diego's favorite indoor landscape. The exotic plants in our lath house were first planted to attract visitors to the 1915 Panama, California Exposition. The building was again used as an exhibit to attract visitors to the California Pacific Exposition in 1935. The exceptional collection of plants still draws an estimated one-half to three-quarter million visitors into the building each year. Entrance has always been free. A lath house is open to the environment, so plants growing inside get no extra heat. What a lath house does is create a shaded environment for plants. Some plants in San Diego's moderate climate do not like to be in full sun and they do not need the extra heat a hothouse supplies. Those are the plants we see thriving here in the lath house. Here's what Alfred Robinson wrote about how a lath house functioned. The sun shining through the lath makes a gridiron on the path. The stripes of shadow and sunlight change places every five minutes and this is why laths must run north and south. Otherwise, sunlight travels down instead of across the opening. Plants you might find in your garden are growing throughout the building, such as azaleas, camellias, geraniums, and fuchsias. A Japanese maple leaves are turning golden today as we walk through the building as we are heading toward winter as we make this video. Growing toward the ceiling are lanky dracaenas and a great collection of tall palms. High above us are tree ferns from Australia and New Zealand. Visitors come to see the building's great collection of plants. As examples, at ground level are collections of ferns, anthuriums, impatiens, sansevieria, peperomias, and many, many others. Harkening back to Alfred Robinson, who was a begonia expert, there are many begonias which do well in the building's microclimate. The large leaf begonia freddy is planted at the east end of the fern bed. There are 12 species of philodendrons in the house, some vining their way toward the ceiling and others spread through the beds. Four of the philodendron species are considered rare, such as the philodendron elegans, and one is a unique, unnamed hybrid. Clumping palms are scattered through the beds. A multi-trunked, variegated ladyfinger palm, Raphus excelsa, popular in Japan, is thought to be the oldest plant in the lath house. I have been told it was planted in 1927. Look up to see the giant Dutchman's pipe vining over the ceiling last. The plant has huge heart-shaped flowers hanging from the ceiling. Below the Dutchman's pipe is one of the larger trees in the lath house, a ficus auriculata or Roxburgh fig. It is unusual as the figs grow on the tree's trunk. I have been told by the maintenance staff the figs from this particular tree do not taste good although it is one of the most cultivated figs in the world. Figs need to be pollinated by small wasps to make the fruit taste sweet. We apparently do not have the necessary wasp in the lath house. At the back door in the center of the building is the most photographed site in the building. A large staghorn fern hangs above the door. Tourists from around the world stand under the fern to have their picture taken. Through the door in prior years was the entrance to the now removed glass house. The building has a great collection of cycads. Cycads date back to the dinosaur era. Some of them here are 75 to 150 years old and are difficult to find in commerce. Among them are cycads from South Africa and cycads native to Mexico and Central America. The nearby bird's nest fern is more than 20 years old. These ferns do well in the building's dappled light. 
In the northeast corner is one of the building's educational exhibits of food crops grown in tropical environments, such as coffee, banana, and spices such as ginger, cardamom, and allspice. In the southwest corner of the building is a dry garden. Today, many tillandsias are used as part of this exhibit. Why would you have a dry garden in such a lush, lush environment? Growing dry weather plants or dry gardens have become popular around the world, even in places that get a lot of rain, like England. In December of 1986, the center of the botanical building was decked out with a display of mass poinsettia plants provided by City Beautiful of San Diego, establishing a cherished annual tradition. The tradition continues every holiday season, beginning in early December before the big December night celebration and continuing through the first week of January. The poinsettia planting is now sponsored by the Friends of Balboa Park. Orchids, when in flower, are brought to decorate the building from the Balboa Park Nursery located along Pershing Drive. Every year around Easter, a large display of Easter lilies is displayed in the building. The tradition has continued now for almost 60 years. Paul Thien selected the plants and supervised their planting for the original planting of the building in 1915. He supervised the nursery where the plants were grown and supervised the landscaping installation on the exposition grounds. He had an important job, but he was virtually unknown at the time. He was born and trained in Germany, and supervising the landscaping of the park was his first major project. He became famous later in his life for landscaping the grounds in Beverly Hills, Montecito, and Pasadena for Southern California's wealthy elite. One of the great myths about this building is that the building once was a railway station. Here's what we know about this fable. This center section was said to be where a turntable was located to turn train engines around. In 1955, without attribution, a San Diego neighborhood newspaper misstated the history of the botanical building, calling it a former Santa Fe train station. The error was reprinted as fact for more than 20 years. The story is false and is rarely repeated today. In April of 2005, San Diego Floral Association installed a bronze plaque inside the Botanical Building. It reads, In Memoriam, Alfred D. Robinson, 1866 to 1942, Founding President of the San Diego Floral Association, 1907. Renowned begonia grower, A.D. Robinson originated the use of a lath house for display of plants at the 1915 Panama, California Exposition. He was the first editor of California Garden Magazine, published continuously since 1909. The Lath Botanical Building, a signature landmark of Balboa Park, continues to showcase exotic and seasonal plants. What does Kate Sessions say about the Botanical Building? According to Balboa Park historian Richard Romero, she is silent about the building. Since Sessions was known to be opinionated, what he meant was she never wrote about the building or her opinion was never quoted. We do not know what she thought. After the 1915 exposition opened, John Morley, park superintendent for 27 years, was responsible for maintaining the plants in the Lath House until he retired in 1939. It has been the care and passion of the city and San Diego gardeners who have maintained this fabulous collection. 